um, Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 31 is what we're covering today. Um, it says here, I'm going to read out of the ESV. It says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as, as a perpetuation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that we might be just, so that he might be just and a justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? Is it excluded? By what kind of law? By the law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. For our God is the God, or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since God is one, it will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So this is our text for today. We probably won't, well, I know we won't get past uh, verse 23, um, maybe 24. Um, but this whole section is, is dealing with Christ as the redemption. Now, you ought to be happy because we've turned the corner here. This is the first time that we get to preach about grace in weeks or months. Okay? Paul starts off his gospel uh, talking about, well, there, there was a, a, a one or two sermons there at the first chapter about grace and about the, the gospel. But other than that, it's been relentless. We're all under sin. We're all condemned. We're all sinners. We not a, not a one of us can earn our way into heaven. And you have to drill that home. You have to drive that home because we, by nature, want to glorify ourselves. That's what went wrong with Adam and Eve. What did they want to do? They wanted to be like God. They wanted to be their own little gods. We, we tend to uh, desire to exalt ourselves. And what Paul did for the last two and a half chapters was tear us apart, pull us apart, and show us our real need for Christ. I mean, if you, um, Romans 3.20 is a little review. For by the works of the law, no human being would be justified. So that's Romans 3.10. None is righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.11, no one understands, no one seeks after God. So what he was saying in these last two chapters, two and a half chapters, was, you know, you don't qualify. And that's important to notice that we don't qualify. We don't meet the mark. What is sin? The definition of sin is missing the mark. That's one of the definitions of sin. You know, you don't make the mark that God sets for you. You can't make the bar. You can't climb over it yourself. You need help. Then we would ask you, I would ask you, well then, you know, does this, this hinges on salvation right here. It hinges on how do you stay saved once you're saved. I mean, we all, I don't know if we all, but a lot of denominations, especially the Baptists, believe that once saved, always saved. And that's how I believe. Because if I didn't save myself, then I can't unsave myself. Put, think of it that way. If God saved me, then God saved me. God's word is true. You see, if God has done a work in me, then he saved me. And we can't earn by salvation by doing good. So you're going to ride this roller coaster, and if your salvation hinges on how you act and how you are, 
in what you think, then you're going to believe that you're not saved. And I told you last week that all you were and me, myself, are unrighteous. Well, this week I'm going to tell you that you are righteous. And you're like, wait a minute, how can you do that? How can you say last week that we're all unrighteous? Because God said so, right? God said we don't make the mark. We miss the mark. But this week, I'm going to tell you that God has declared you righteous. And if God has declared you righteous, then you're righteous. There's no argument about it. If you believe God's word to be true, and he declares something righteous, then you're righteous. And you have to stand on that. How do you stand on that? You stand on that by faith and faith alone. Because you can't, if you look around, and you're, you're, you're like Peter in the water sinking, you know, you got to look to Christ. you got to have faith because there's things that happen around us that want to drag us down. But we have to stand on that firm rock and say, by faith he has declared me righteous, and if I'm declared righteous by the God Almighty, then I'm righteous. Well, now we're going to talk today. How can he declare an unrighteous person righteous? Isn't that a contradiction? How can God do that? Well, we'll, we'll see. I like this first part of this verse. The very first verse that we're reading, Romans chapter 3, verse 21, the first two words are amazing. Because up until now, we, I, you know, it's been tough on you guys and myself for the last couple of weeks. Sin and hellfire and judgment and damnation. But that's important to know because that's all true. But what does Paul say? But now. But now is what he says. He's starting this off. He says, but now. Well, what happens when the accuser comes? And the accuser says, you're not worthy to be a holy person. You're not worthy to be one of God's elect. You're not worthy for salvation. I mean, uh, every time the accuser comes, there's a hint of truth to what he's saying. But you can stand there and say, but now God has declared me righteous. But now I stand on a rock. It's, yes, you're right. I am not worthy. Okay, I can agree with that point. But now, Christ and God himself has declared me righteous. Not that the fact that it's my righteousness. He hasn't changed me uh, physically. He has declared me righteous. I'm going to explain that. I'm going to explain that. But see, you become a Christian. You start this road to sanctification. Your life starts improving. You start doing the things of God because you love God, because God has forgiven you much, so you love Him much. You do these things not to earn your salvation, but because you're pleased with God, because He pleases you, because there's this communion now with God. So now you desire these things, and you're going down this road. But when you look at it, there's these thoughts that come into your head that say, well, what about this sin that you just did? I'm not worthy to be a pastor. I'm not worthy to be a member of One Way Christian Center. I'm not worthy to be a Christian. Okay, you're right. You're not. But if God has declared you righteous, don't let that hinder you. Don't let that push you down. Because if God has picked you up, how can this stuff pull you down anymore? You're letting it bother you. You're letting it boggle you down when you should be soaring above this stuff. Because God has said that we're righteous. God has declared you righteous. Now here, it says, uh, Genesis 15, 6. This is what God had told Abraham, or Abram. I uh, wasn't sure what he was called then. I think it's probably Abram. But he says, and he believed the Lord. Who? Abram. He believed the Lord, and he counted or reckoned it to him for righteousness. Reckoned. He counted him righteous. Now, 
you have to have the knowledge of sin to have a knowledge of grace. These things go hand in hand. How can you be given grace if you don't need grace? How can grace help you if you don't need grace? So Paul starts his gospel with the desperate plea to you that you need grace. But now I'll ask you, how can God, a righteous God, take somebody that we know ourselves and count us for righteousness? How can he reckon somebody for righteousness when the last couple chapters we've noted that all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God? Now, a lot of times we miss the point about this. We just think when we pray our prayers and stuff, we ask the Lord to forgive us of our sins. Sometimes, we, I think today, sometimes God is misrepresented as this God that just blatantly forgives sin and casts it away. Now, that's true. He does forgive sin and he casts it away. But... How does he do it and still maintain his righteousness? See, for God to say that I'm counting you as righteous, that would be a contradiction because we're not righteous. We're not worthy. The thing is, is that sin has been paid for by Christ. You see, he's not just casting the sin away. He casted that sin upon his son, and it was nailed to the cross, and his son bore your sins. There's more to it than just saying, I've been forgiven of my sins. Your sins, the penalty was paid. You hear the word remission of sins. Where does that come from? To remit. Janine might know this. You're our treasure. When you remit, you're making a payment. The remission of sins. There was a payment made for your sins to be remitted, to be removed. It was paid in full on the cross when Christ said, it is finished. He uses a banking term. It's paid in full. You see, that's how it can happen. This is how God maintains his righteousness, maintains his justification, maintains his justness, and can count us sinners is righteous now thus God is righteous God is loving I mean you you think well in today's circles we think that well God is so loving that he'll forgive everyone of their sin God is also just so there's all these attributes of God. You gotta, I mean, you people say, well, pastor, I don't want to be a theologian. Well, if you want to be a Christian, you need to know something about God. And theology is a study of God. Okay? And that helps. It helps you from doing this on that roller coaster throughout your life. See, God is just, and he's loving. He's all of everything. He's everything we could want. Now, the next verse says, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Well, let's stop here a minute. And he's not saying the righteousness of man. I want to get that through us. It's not the righteousness of man, is what he's saying. And why is he not, why did he say the righteousness of God? Now, I mean, the Trinity wouldn't he say the righteousness of Jesus? See, today, I think we tend to look at God as his bad character in some circles of Christianity. God is the big meanie, and Jesus comes to save the world. Don't, sometimes you get that impression. You read the Old Testament, and you see God punishing people. You see things are strict. Then you see Jesus coming and forgiving people. And we have this division between God and Christ. But God, this is his plan. This is God's plan. He put it into action before the foundation of the world. He deemed it, and he settled it, and he sent his son. So they're equally glorious. You see, they're one. They're the Trinity. 
But don't get the wrong idea and, and always, you know, uh, include God in your prayers. Don't think he's this unapproachable uh, being. God is the holies of holies is open up. You can go in. The curtain was ripped. You can go before the holies of holies. And God is there. So he says righteousness of God. Well, I want to say this. Do we, uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 19, which we didn't read, but it says this, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed. If you're under the law, your mouth is closed. You can't boast in yourself. So what, I'm, what we're saying here is this is the righteousness of God, not my righteousness. We always want to supplement God. And that's bad. We can't build on what God has done. We can accept it. We can take it by faith. But we can't improve on it. And I'll show you why, how that happens here. Um. Now, some say there's no more law. In some Christian circles, you'll hear, well, the law has been abolished. There is no more law. We don't have to follow the law. Wrong. The law is still there. The law bears witness to our sinfulness. You see? Christ, grace, and God's plan, God's righteous plan, gives us an ability to be right with God, even though we're still under the law. Jesus said, I'm not taking one jot or tittle away from this law. i come to fulfill it. So he came to fulfill the law for us. That don't mean that we can go, and you'll see later in Romans, you just can't go and do anything saying, well, I'm a Christian and I live by faith and grace. But you can't let it condemn you because you are a Christian. There's this fine line you walk. If God has declared you righteous, you are righteous. If you fall and stumble, he says, but now, the righteousness of God. You have to realize that you're his child. Now, the law convicts and condemns. It's not meant to save you. It's Christ that saves you. The law witnesses against you. But it's Christ. It's the, the plan of God that has saved you. Now this all, all of this, witnesses to the righteousness of God. It exalts God. Romans chapter, uh, well, the next verse it says, Righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Well, what is this saying to me? It says, The righteousness of God. Now, let me say this. Last week's sermon and this week's sermon should be played together. Because last week's sermon was pretty rough. This week's sermon is telling you that you have grace that you have a gift but you need to know that you can't do it on your own therefore you take God's gift this week and I felt bad leaving you hanging last week I said next week I'll give you some grace <laughs> you see so these two should be uh, high on your list because these are some of the most important verses in the Bible right here this whole section in Romans it says, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Christ is the object of our faith. Now let me say this. I've got to be careful to point this out. It's not your faith that saves you. Your faith is the instrument that you receive salvation. But your salvation comes from the Lord. You can't even boast on your faith. Well, I got great faith, so I'm saved. You can't boast on that. It's not your faith that saves you. Now, all you can do 
is have faith that he has done it. That's all you can do. I mean, that you, as a physical man, that's helpless to me. That, that at times, I mean, I like to fix things. Well, my wife and I get into a fight. I'll follow her around the house until she either gets mad enough at me or we get it fixed, right? <laughs> I want to fix it. But we got to have faith. We can't, we don't fix ourselves. We don't, we don't earn our salvation. We can just have faith. We can have faith in the Lord. And I want to give you a story that's in the Bible. It's in Matthew chapter 22. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll read one verse. But I'm going to tell you the story, and you all know it. You probably do. It's this king. He has a wedding. So he invites his honored guest. He sends out an invitation, and he invites all the people he wants to invite. And they don't come. As a matter of fact, the people that he says to go invite these people, when these people go out to invite them in, they torture and kill and maim his, his representatives who went out and took the invitations out. So there's this wedding, and it's going to happen. And then all these people are invited, but they don't come. So then what's the king do? He says, go out into the highways and byways and get all that you can find and bring them in. Bring them into this great wedding. Bring them in from this place and that place and this place and that place and bring them in. Now, it doesn't say this. I'm going to read this verse here, Matthew 22, verse 11. It says, but when the king came in to the look at the guest, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. And if you read the history behind this, it doesn't say in the Bible, but tradition says that when a king's having a wedding feast, he would supply robes for all his guests. So they all wore white robes or a dress that he provided for his guests. Kind of like how the wedding party provides um, the bridesmaids and the grooms and all this stuff, uh, their equipment, their, their outfits and all this. So the king comes out into the wedding, and he sees a person standing there in his dirty clothes. And he says, cast him out of here. We're outside where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now here's this guy given a robe to make himself look clean. And he, de he says, now I'm not going to put it on. I don't want to put it on. Why don't you put it on? Well, what would be the reasons for that? You think about it. Okay, well, I go in and I, you know what, King? I got these new set of duds and they look cool. And I want to show them off to you, right? And King's like, I don't care about your duds. I don't care about your clothes. I gave you a robe. Where is it? Well, I thought it wasn't that good. I'm going to show you what I brought to the table. And the king gets mad. He says, no, this is what I gave you to wear. You're not wearing it. Get out. And that's how God declares us righteous. Underneath that robe is my dirty self. But God clothes me in the blood of Christ. He's clothed me with Christ. Is where I stand in his wedding feast, and I'm wearing something pure. And when the king looks upon me, he looks upon something pure because it's his son that he's looking upon. It's not myself. Now, as long as I'm still here, I'm reckoned as righteous. I'm counted as righteous. I haven't changed. My flesh is still my flesh. I still have struggles. But by faith, I'm wearing the righteous robe of Christ. Picture it in your mind. You're putting on that white robe, that righteous robe, and you're wearing that righteous robe of Christ. It's where when God looks at you, he sees his son. And, he, and you're washed in his blood. And now there's no more sin for God to look at. When he looks at you, he sees righteousness. Because it's his righteousness, not your righteousness. It, 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 and for the person that wants to wear his own clothes at the wedding. 
It doesn't matter what you bring to the table. It's not good enough. It's not the righteousness of Christ. Don't fool yourself. What you bring to the table is not what God is looking for. God is looking for you to submit to Him and to have faith and say, thank you. Thank you for your righteousness. Thank you. Now, Zephaniah. We should study that book next. It says, and on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 8. This is a pretty interesting chapter. Uh, kind of sounds like the judgment. Whoever's not wearing the clothes that God had given them. And why not? Because we want to show the king that we bring something to the table instead of relying on him. Revelation, another, another illustration. I think when it comes to faith, if you picture God giving you this white robe, to wear like in the in the banquet of this the wedding that where god can look at you this despite of how ugly you are inside despite of what thoughts you had this morning even despite of the roller coaster ride that you're on one minute you're high for christ and god the next minute you're down in the gutter despite of that you're wearing god's righteousness he, if God has declared you righteous, you've accepted Him as your personal Savior, and He has declared you righteous, then who are you to tell anyone else that you're not? If God has declared it, then why do you believe the lie of the accuser? We can all acknowledge that we have sin. We know that. But we have our sin paid for, remitted, paid in full by Christ. So you got to be careful how far you go with that. Because it's very important to recognize that you have sin because he who is forgiven much loves much. But it's also important to know that you belong to the king's court. That he's given you a cloak of righteousness. Uh, Revelation chapter 6 verse 11 it says then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little while until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were killed as they themselves had been God gives us this they didn't bring it themselves who gave it to them God gave it to them well God I got my own coat right here it looks pretty cool don't you think no God gives you the righteousness he uses these visuals so we can understand them. Now, if we go on in verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God in Romans here. What is Paul saying? Paul says this all the way through. He says, There is no distinction for the Jew or for the non-Jew. No distinction between you and me. It says all have sinned and fallen short. Billy Graham has sinned and fallen short. Sorry to say, but the Pope has sinned and fallen short. Not one person can get into heaven without his righteousness applied. Without his righteousness accounted to him and reckoned to him. And if you want to list the apostles... They have sinned and fallen short. All the characters in the Bible have sinned and fallen short at some point in their life. Who can say that they have uh, loved the Lord thy God with all their heart and all their mind and all their soul all the days of their life? Not one of us. And we talked about that last week. Now verse 24 says, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Well, sometimes we miss the point here on this gift. We think it's just a normal gift. Okay, uh, uh, you know, Alicia's been really nice to me, and I'm going to get her a gift. Well, that's not the motivation God has. Because we haven't been nice to Him. You, you see, we haven't been nice to him and God's not expecting anything back when he gives us his gift because he knows we're not 
able to produce back. So I might bring Alicia a gift thinking I get out of the doghouse, expecting something back. But see, God doesn't expect anything back. He gives a gift freely. Now, of course, we do give back, but it doesn't meet the standard of the gift given. That's for sure. But you think about it. Would you give a gift to somebody that slanders your name? Would you? No, nah, probably not. That's why we're not God. Would you give a gift to somebody that steals from you? Probably not. Would you give a gift to somebody that hurts your family? How many people hurt other Christians? How many Christians hurt other Christians? How many Christians don't put the amount that they're supposed to in the offering basket? How many Christians use the Lord's name in vain? How many Christians do these things? Would you give a gift to somebody that disrespects your mother? Would you give a gift to somebody that has adultery, that committed adultery against you? We do that. Anytime we give anything, any precedence over God, anytime that there's a reason other than what we have to come to church, to worship Him, to glorify Him, we find some reason to stay home and watch cartoons or, or mow our yard over worshiping the Most High God of all as a church body. But he's given us this gift, and we don't deserve it. That's the important thing to get to know, how you can love God so much, because the gift that he's given, not a one of us deserve it. But he's given it. He has given it. And what he's declared righteous is righteous. Not one of us deserve it, but he gave it. So can we make it up? We can try. But we're not gonna we're not gonna reach that. I mean, I think a good healthy uh Christian walk because you're you're glad of what he's done for you is really, really good. I mean, that's what we're supposed to do, that's sanctification. But don't get it in your mind that you're gonna pay God back because you can never pay him back for what he's given you. That's just impossible. A gift is something that does doesn't get paid back. So as we go forward in this study, I want to remind you about this but now. If God has declared you righteous and you're going through something and you're down here, you can tell the devil and Satan, but now God has declared me righteous. Yeah, you might be right about that. Yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, I did wrong. But God has declared me righteous. And this will not get me down. Even though I'm dealing with something right now, God has declared. And when God has declared something, it is. It's not our righteousness. If it was our righteousness, this roller coaster ride would be a roller coaster ride. I want to get you straight and level to know that even though you feel like you're in a dip, that God has raised you above that. And you can look out and you can see God's righteousness. There's no reason for us to be down in a dip. You're, you're part of the king's court. You have been given all things. There's nothing more that you could want. I mean, when you have what you have. And there's up and down, there, we don't need it. And, it. and we picked out the most amazing song to end. This service. I didn't pick it up. Alicia did. It was Amazing Grace. Wow, what a song for what we're, what we're talking about here. Because it is amazing. And when you grab a hold of how important it is to hang on to that, hang on to that robe, that, that white linen that you're clothed in by faith. Don't let these wavering thoughts come into your mind. Keep it by faith. 
No, if Jesus says that I'm righteous, then I'm righteous. You see? And I'm not righteous because of me. I'm righteous because he declared me righteous because he took my sins and put them to his son. The sins were paid for. So that's very important to know that every time we sin, every time it's already been paid for. But the thing was, is there was a penalty paid for your sin. So don't think of it as no big deal anymore. It is a big deal. We're, we're to follow him and follow his law. But we know that through the law, no one can be justified. We have to have grace. And that's what Paul's going to talk about here. And I can't wait. Because this gets better and better and better. Every week that we deep, go deeper in what Paul's talking about, it's going gonna, it's gonna to grow your walk with Christ. It's where you won't be up and down. You should be on a level playing field or a high plateau right now, knowing that God has reckoned something that is not holy, holy. And you, you have to be that way to be in front of him. So let's sing this last song together. And if anybody needs prayer,